Tonight, the boys take you on a ride to sweet, sweet Italy. We're talking that mother pasta and those mother sports cars and mother catacombs. Oh, baby. Please strap on tight and get ready to board the midnight train and choo-choo mother... Passengers, and welcome to the Midnight Train, America's second favorite podcast where we bring the dark to light, where history never dies, and where listener discretion is always advised. Yes, we make fun of and joke about the creepy and unsolved mysteries of the world, all while attempting to bring you as much information on each topic as possible. Yeah, we kind of consider ourselves a comedy podcast. We got to gotta keep it lighthearted because we do talk about some pretty dark topics. So if you're not into that, listen. No hard feelings. It's all good. It's all cool. Great. Thanks for stopping by. Don't let the door hit you where the good Lord split you. Ah! Just kidding. But if you do like that kind of stuff and you're like, hey, I'll give it a chance. Cool. Welcome. And to the rest of you who have been here before, welcome back. I am the host, your host. With the most. With the most. I don't know about the most. <laughs> <laughs> Jonathan Sayer, of course. And with me, you know, it's the one and only. It's Logan. Yay. Hello. I forgot to say I'm the conductor of the cryptic. I forgot. Yeah. My little. That's a big tag. My moniker. Yeah. Moniker. It's my moniker. You're not wearing one though. A what? What? A moniker. What? What do you know? <laughs> monocle. Monocle. <laughs> I, mean, I, need, I need a monocle. That'd be, That'd be amazing. amazing. <laughs> I'm going to just talk like this the entire time. <laughs> so listen, we've got ourselves a banger of an episode today. It's going to be so much fun. We're actually going back to Creepyville in our Creepy series. Oh, yeah. It's going to be awesome. And so we're heading to Italy, Italy. Italia. Buongiorno. Buonasera. <laughs> Bippity boppity boo. <laughs> no, sh- I'll get slapped when I do that. Damn. Yeah, I can't do it. Uh, for Patreon this week, we are going to be talking about the one and only H.H. Holmes. And we're going to be talking about, uh, if you don't know who he is, you're going to learn. And if you think you know who he is, I'm going to tell you some new stuff about him. Ooh. So in order to uh, get over there and listen to the F That Guy series, Series, uh, sign up for Patreon at patreon.com forward slash the Midnight Train Podcast or go to the Midnight Train Podcast.com, our official website. Dot com. Dot com. All right. This is going to be a long one, folks. So, uh, as, as, as uh, Satan said in the beginning, strap on tight. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to save the rest of the business stuff until the end. You know how we do it. So, let's just get into it here. Let's turn down the lights, adjust our seats. Grab a drink coffee for me this morning. Yes, it's a yes, monster for yes. me. And let's get Italiano. Hey! Ave Maria. <laughs> when the moon hits your eye <laughs> like some big freaking guy. I don't know. <laughs> Here's a toast to all you beautiful motherfuckers. And we are, yeah, we are epic as fuck. I love that fucking song. It is pretty badass. It's so good. See, all these other podcasts you guys happen to listen to out there, none of them can claim to be epic as fuck. No, they can't. Because we yes. are epic as fuck. Yes. Speaking of epic as fuck, Italy. Ha <laughs> ha! Yeah, Italia. Yes. So the history of Italy is, in many respects, the history of the modern world, right? Italy is the historical cornerstone of Europe since it has witnessed so many significant events in our shared past. And 
being over there and being in Florence so I can actually have like a little bit of fir- first-hand knowledge of this, which right. is why I really wanted to do uh, Italy. Um, it's it's like it's seriously like you're just walking through history. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like the the cobblestone um, on the, the the ground, you know the the roads and stuff, dude. It was just it was epic as fuck, like legit. <laughs> so various ethnic groups and origins inhabited Italy by 500 BC. For example, Sicily's island and the southern shore are covered in little Greek settlements. Yeah, yeah little little Greek settlements. So a bunch of little hairy chest fuckers are just running around everywhere. Just Perfect. kidding, if you happen to be Greek. But you know it's true. <laughs> you know it is. Um, we're definitely going to go through the history, of course, because, I mean, we're going to go through a part of the history. We could literally do, like, four freaking episodes yeah, so on just history. the history of Italy. Yeah, because if you keep in mind, like, they have, like, in, in, like, the Romans and the Greeks and all that shit all had laid and claim to them as well, too. Oh, yeah. There was, there's so much. So much. So much. So much. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> so, Gauls. Okay. Oh, and by the way, um, if you have missed me uh, screwing up a lot of words, well, <laughs> guess what? Today's the day for you. Jack is yeah, back. Yeah, yeah. So, Gauls, the forerunners of modern France, roamed the northern mountains. Okay. In contrast, the Etruscans, a group originating from western Turkey, arrived in central Italy and founded several city-states, including the one now known as Bologna. <laughs> oh, wait. It's now Bologna. It's Bologna. It's Bologna. Hey, Bologna. I like my Bologna with some cheese. And fried. <laughs> oh, and fried. Yeah, fried, fried Bologna, Bologna sandwich. sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> the Etruscan uh, civilization flourished for a while, giving rise to Rome's successor. Although little is known about it, it was notable for its bold architecture. The stone arches, the paved streets, aqueducts, and sewers. Like, they were just, I mean, the stuff they built, even if it was just, like, a sewer, it was, like, beautiful. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it was great, yeah. all handmade. You they're could like, walk through it. Yeah, they're like, ah, hey, this is where we're going to have at the poop. Make, make, it, make it look nice. <laughs> <laughs> where, where are we going to do it, the boo-boos? The boo-boos? So, Romulus and Remus, okay? You ever heard of these guys? I heard of Romulus. I didn't know he had a brother. Mm-hmm. Uh, twin brothers claiming to be the sons of the war god Mars, <laughs> which yeah. is the Roman guy of he's he's Aries, he's Aries. Yes. Yeah, he's I got Greek. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, whatever. I don't yeah. know. And to have been raised as newborns by a she wolf, mm-hmm, are said to have built Rome on April twenty first of seven fifty three B C. So they had furries back then too, apparently. Yeah. That's, oh, yeah. <laughs> Romulus wanted Rome to take on, if not surpass, the role of the legendary city since he considered himself a descendant of Troy's vanquished army. Romulus killed his brother and proclaimed himself the first ruler of Rome when Remus mocked the whole idea. Oh, well, that's why we only ever heard of Romulus. Right. Well, yeah. <laughs> so now there are several different versions of how Remus was killed on the day Rome was supposedly founded. In Livy or Livy's version, Remus died after jumping over Romulus's wall, which is thought to be a sign from the gods of Rome's power and fate. So Romulus uh, was building, he was starting to build and wanted to, you know, have walls and like this big empire or whatever. Right. And they're saying that his brother just was kind of like <laughs> over the wall. I can only imagine being like in a catapult getting launched over yeah. it and hit the fucking right. wall. Are you ready to rock me over? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's what they're saying on that one. Okay. Now, according to St. Jerome, Remus was killed for his mockery by one of Romulus's supporters, uh, Fabius, or C- I'm going to say Sealer. It's Celery. So it's not Celery. It looks like Celery without the Y. So maybe it's Celery. Maybe. I don't know. Oh. Who killed Remus by throwing a spade at his head. That's always fun. Interesting. Right. Afterward, Romulus uh, mournfully buries his brother, giving him full funeral honors. However, most sources would convey that Romulus killed Remus. So everyone's... There's a few different stories, but for the most part, everyone's like, nah, we're pretty sure that Romulus killed Probably a, uh, <laughs> hey, do me a favor, go kill that guy. Right. Oh, you killed my brother. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to do the bop da booby. I'm not going to do it. <laughs> Until the last king was ousted and the Roman Republic was established in 509 BC, Rome was ruled by seven different kings. Rome was then governed by two elected officials known as consuls, a wealthy aristocratic senate known as patricians, and a lesser assembly known as plebeians. Is that a race in Star Wars? I, probably. <laughs> I have no idea. It might be. The plebs. <laughs> the plebs. Plebeians? It might be plebeians, actually. It looks like plebeians, right? Yeah. We're going to go with that. That represented the ordinary people, but had less authority. The, ple- the plebeians. They did. The plebs. The pleb. The plebes. <laughs> <laughs> this type of governance initially functioned well, but the government structure could have been much better when Rome grew beyond the scope of a simple city-state to conquer land, not just in Italy, and all over the damn place. Do it. Because they were out there doing it. 
So Rome experienced a crisis by the first century BC. An enslaved person named Spartacus led a populist uprising against the patrician uh, aristocracy. Rome ended the rebellion, but doing so came at a very high cost. The Republic fell apart and was replaced by a string of military dictatorships, culminating in Julius Caesar's assassination. It's ass ass nation. Ass 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 in nation. Yes. Okay. Under God. <laughs> <laughs> so now, who was Julius Caesar? I'm, I'm sure, as most of you know, he invented a horrible salad with anchovy paste. It's delicious. Damn you, Caesar! Damn you! That's too brute. <laughs> I can't do. I can't do. Um, Caesar. Caesar. Ugh. Yeah. Ugh. I like it. Yeah. It's good. But seriously, who was Julius Caesar? I'm sure most of you listening right now have probably heard at least the name. Yeah. Right. If not, if you don't know more about it. So born in July of 100 BC, Julius Caesar would grow up to become one of the most famous and influential leaders ever. As a prolific writer and a great orator, it means he was very good at speaking to people. Oh, he yes. was very good with the oral communication. Correct. He was orally inclined. Oh, ho, ho. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Strap on. As Cleopatra knows, you know we'll talk about that. Anyway. Oh, damn. Caesar's communication skills helped him gain the Roman people's respect, adoration, and support, obviously. Throughout his lifetime, Caesar worked as a lawyer in the Basilica, oh boy, uh, Gulia? <laughs> held the position of Pontifex Maximus, and even ranked as an army general, defeating areas long believed to be unconquerable, such as Britain and Gaul. Okay, I'm sorry, but I'd rather be known as a Pontifex Maximus than an army general. Yes. That's like, how do you go from Pontifex Maximus to, yeah, I rule armies and shit, and it's cool. Um, but what if Pontifex Maximus is like a part of your body? Like a gluteus Maximus? What, what if, I got what, the biggest ass around, man. I don't, I don't give a shit. That sounds awesome. Yeah. So furthermore, he was named the governor of Gaul and held various high-profile political positions within the Roman Republic. And he was the the he was for the people. He yeah. loved his people. So was Palpatine. You know? Huh? What? Would you say? I said so was Palpatine. Oh well. <laughs> but he like generally he was like if you yeah. go back and you look at any kind of historical documents and stuff. And don't get me wrong, Caesar did some, he had some fucked up shit in his past that he did. Yeah. But he was. I mean, you hear the word dictator. And immediately you're like, oh, God, you think of, you know, the worst guys ever. And we'll yeah. talk about one of them here in a little bit. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But um, but he was like, literally, the people loved him. Yeah. You know? So during his rise to fame, Caesar became significantly powerful and never shied away from showing his disapproval of the Roman Senate, which would inevitably lead to his demise. Yeah. He, like the Senate, were super afraid because they ran stuff mm. and then you got this guy coming in that's basically like the people love him and he's trying to be like no i'm gonna run the show right it's what i say it is, this is how i'm gonna do it because i'm for the people and they're like fuck yeah <laughs> this guy's gonna fuck it up for everybody yeah i fucking hate caesar salads you know what i mean <laughs> so they were yeah they weren't happy so meanwhile the uh, conservative leaders of the senate including his frenemy pompey decided to take action in fear that caesar may stir up trouble for them Thus, they ordered Caesar to disband his armies and return to Rome to face prosecution following his rise to power in Gaul. But alas, Caesar would not bear to face this punishment as he was cocksure and more confident than ever. Cocksure. That's, that's a good one. People don't use that enough. You guys can use that. You're There's a whole lot of dicks in this one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait. We just started, buddy. Oh. So after defying the Roman Senate's orders and winning several significant battles, Caesar returned to Rome to proclaim himself dictator for life. But little did he know he would be brutally assassinated by his so-called peers just two months later. Because he wanted his own month, that's why. <laughs> well, we'll talk. We'll talk. <laughs> this exact moment would alter the course of history forever. However, the legacy of Julius Caesar very well lives on today as he remains at the forefront of history books and a prominent icon in pop culture. Now, here are some reasons why Julius Caesar was simply a badass. Oh, yeah. All right. While most people immediately recognize, you know, Julius Caesar, the name, few know that his first name was actually Gaius. Oh. Okay. After both his father and grandfather. Contrary to popular belief, the cesarean section, you know, a C-section for pregnancies or whatever, uh, the birthing procedure here was not named after Julius Caesar. I don't know uh, why people thought that. <laughs> that yeah, that doesn't make any sense. I, yeah, because it's, it's but we, uh, we'll, we'll talk. Yeah. The procedure existed long before that, uh, before he was born and was reserved for mothers who often experienced complications or death during childbirth. Thus, historians dismissed the claim that Julius Caesar created the term cesarean section because Caesar's mother, um, Aurelia, uh, she lived a very long and healthy life after he was born. Hmm. You know? So where did the iconic Caesar name originate from? 
according to the ancient historian Pliny the Elder, which is also a fantastic beer if you guys get a chance to try it. Pliny. Pliny the Elder. It's so good. It's so hoppy. It's so wonderful. Oh, my God. Anyway, <laughs> sorry. Uh, the name may have come from one of Julius's great ancestors who happened to be born by the Caesarian procedure. So it wasn't that the C-section was named after Caesar. It was Caesar was named after the C-section. Ah. Uh, ah. Uh, you see uh, what I'm saying? Uh, like the cot before the horse and the horse before the cot and the chicken and the egg. See? Ha <laughs> <laughs> Other interpretations of the name suggest its uh, roots in Latin for bright gray eyes or a thick head of hair. Oh. Yes. Another interesting idea is that Caesar stems from the Moorish word for elephant, hinting that one of Julius's ancient relatives may have once killed an elephant in battle. Now, it's uncertain which of these is true, but, you know, perhaps Caesar favored the, uh, the elephant here as he actually used it in, uh, in fighting. He actually rode an elephant mm -hmm. and even had his own coinage printed with images of elephants on it. So maybe he just liked elephants. I just I find that hilarious that if your dad killed an animal before you were born, that's the name that you're going to be given back then. Yes, I'm sorry, Logan, but I killed a, uh, a chipmunk. And you before you were born, <laughs> your name is now Chip. <laughs> I'm Chip. I'm Doral. Sorry. So Julius Caesar was undoubtedly a ladies' man. His first marriage was to Cornelia in 84 BC, followed by Pompeia in 67 BC. But his final wife was the teenage Calpurnia, to whom he was married from 59 BC until he died. Aww. Some historians say that Caesar may have had other mistresses and male lovers. I mean, when in Rome, yeah, that's and literally, <laughs> literally. Hold on, you get, you get it, and you get this. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm glad how you shoehorn that in right there. You're welcome. Now, some historians say that Caesar may have, again, other the mistress, mistresses and whatnot, but it's, it's hard to put an exact number on his relationships, okay? However, his relationship with the Queen of Egypt, Cleopatra, was the most notorious and perhaps scandalous. <laughs> this power couple met after Caesar chased down his enemy, Pompey, to Egypt. There, Caesar and Cleopatra formed a mutually beneficial relationship full of wealth and military power. Mm -hmm. You got two badasses coming together. This is like the, the Jay-Z and, and Queen B mm -hmm. of the ancient time. You know what I mean? It's cray-cray. Coming in and killing stuff, except I don't think Caesar and uh, Cleopatra were Satanists. Anyway, um, <laughs> you see how that's all in the news yep, now? Yep. Like, come on. You guys got to stop that. Yeah, we yeah, talked yeah. about that in one of our episodes about, yep. you know, the Satanism thing and how it's in music. and it's, it's not, folks. Let's relax. Yeah. Satan will talk about that later. <laughs> right. Exactly. He's got something to say. So not long after Cleopatra gave birth to a son named Caesarian. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Undoubtedly named after the guy who made that shitty salad. Or Julius Caesar. Anyway, uh, my notes really aren't clear. So following unrest in Alexandria, Cleopatra and Caesarian fled to Rome for protection. There, Caesar supposedly erected a golden statue of the queen and never denied that he was Caesarian's daddy. Hmm. Okay. However, it is unknown if their love affair continued in the Eternal City. Since it, like when she moved back there, they're not sure if they still kicked it up. You know, gotcha. like they still kicking it over oh. in Rome. You know what I'm saying? Uh, that, yeah, I mean, you know it, I mean, it definitely was. Yeah, I'm sure there was probably some back, back, backside stuff. You know, mm -hmm. that's probably where all those catacombs come from. Right, he has to yeah. hide somewhere. <laughs> that's where that's where he was hiding the whole time. Yep. Since it is certainly, um, you know, it wasn't admirable for Caesar to have a foreign lover because she was Egyptian, especially when he was already married. Cleopatra and her son fled back to Egypt following his assassination. Caesarian would ultimately be killed there by Caesar's great nephew and heir, Octavian. Oh, it's crazy. Dude, listen. There's so much death and just backstabbing and incest and craziness back in the day. Oh, oh my yeah. God. Gotta love Oedipus. Yeah. So now, uh, did you know that Caesar was the father of the leap year? Hmm. Yeah. So the Julian calendar was the last calendar used before the one we actually know today and use today. And you guessed it, it was introduced by none other than Julius Caesar. As we know it, an ordinary year is made up of 365 days, mm -hmm. right? However, the actual time it takes for the Earth to go around the sun, okay, once, is 365.24 days. Hence, adding a leap year was necessary to compensate for the time difference built up over the years, right? Before Caesar, the early Romans' method of uh, timekeeping was, uh, it was inaccurate, causing the holidays and seasons to fall just a little bit off track. Mm -hmm. Therefore, Caesar consulted with the astronomer <laughs> Susagenes. Sure. Susagenes. 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 I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. In 45 BC to devise a solution. 
Together, they designed the Julian calendar, which consisted of 365 days and a leap year that occurred every four years, where an extra 29th day was added at the end of February. <laughs> so fucking complicated. <laughs> no, it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> this, I mean, it does make sense, but yeah. It's just, yeah. Yeah. This timekeeping uh, system was so effective that it remained in use for over 1,500 years. However, even the slightest miscalculations increase over time, proving the Julian calendar slightly off. But by how much exactly? Caesar's year was too long by just 11 minutes and 14 seconds. That adds up, man. Yeah. We're actually like three days ahead now because of that. If you like do all the math and shit like that, like our calendar doesn't line up with his calendar. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're like like almost a week ahead. If not more. Yeah. I mean, since then. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, it's pretty wild. It's quick, right? So though it may seem like a tiny inaccuracy, the time increased over the years when Pope Gregory the 13th, I believe. Yeah. D- is that 13th? No. Yeah. That's 8th. No, it's 13. 13. That's what I said. Yeah, I was right. Yeah, you were right. Hey. I didn't question you. Hey. Hey. Even the sun shines on a dog's ass once in a while. You know, I, God damn it, I messed it up. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, this guy, the Pope, decided to modify the system in 1582. So he changed the Julian calendar to make leap years occur every four years, except in years divisible by 100, but not 400. Totally not confusing. Wait, what? Yeah. Oh, I, I, I don't know, dude. I just, I just read the shit. I don't have to understand it. I just work here, man. Yep. So now uh, we referenced him making his own coins earlier. Yes. Okay. So Julius Caesar was the first Roman politician to have his portrait minted on coins during his lifetime. Up until 44 BC, no living man or woman had appeared on Roman denarii. Thus, this widely exchanged image was propaganda for Caesar's power and influence, right? I got my face on a coin. I'm better than you. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I'm on my face on a coin. We can do that. Yeah? Yeah. Can you really? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't know if my face... I got a big head. It'd just be like half my face. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe look like, like like George Washington from the side. Yeah. yeah. Except my nose might not. I don't know. George Washington's nose is pretty nose. big. But he also has that like weird ass like powdered wig shit yeah. as well too. Should I get one of those too? No, you you don't have any hair, so it'd be perfect. What they make up for with the head features. So it's more like Truman on his. Ah, I'll take it. I'll take it. So while the adoring public may not have minded, of course, the Senate most likely regarded this act as an unacceptable act of arrogance. Oh, how Bad. dare you? Yeah, exactly. He put his face on a coin? We use that. Ah, what a bastard. Back in the day, a Roman uh, d- denarius or silver coin, their, you know, their coinage, was an ordinary means of payment. However, collectors today are willing to pay thousands of dollars for one of these Caesar coins. Yeah, that'd be amazing. It would be pretty cool to have. So how can you distinguish Julius Caesar's portrait from any other Roman figure of the time? Well, there are a few signs. For one, images of Caesar looked more realistic than idolized. Or uh, idealized. 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 Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) This means you can actually see the folds in his neck and any wrinkles or imperfections he might have had. He was like, nah, make me look like I look. That's actually fucking cool. Yeah. How's that arrogance? That's what I'm saying. It's the, The Senate just absolutely hated the guy. So t- I am the set. <laughs> <laughs> so typically you can also tell that he is a man of older age, perhaps representing his wisdom. Though you may not see these particular details in, uh, in small coins, you can uh, tell it's him uh, by his large and crooked nose, uh, evident in the depictions of his side profile. So it's pretty cool. That is pretty cool. So Caesar obviously was adored by the people, and you know, this is actually pretty cool. Uh, it's 100% true that Caesar, you know, they, the people loved him and he loved them. Right. You know what I mean? During his dictatorship, he made many strides to reduce debt and unemployment and give the Roman people better lives. To start, Caesar proposed new laws that redistributed lands to the poor and limited the amount of money that one person could have on them at once. That's pretty sweet. I mean, it's, yeah, yeah, it's cool, but then it sucks. It's, it's but that, that whole thing, too. Like, then why do I, why should I work harder if, if, if I can't have m- more money? Yeah. If you're just going to give my money to somebody else? Sounds familiar. Kind of. Uh, yeah, yeah, let's keep going. Yeah. Furthermore, Caesar offered jobs to the poor to work in Rome's overseas colonies and even granted citizenship to foreigners living in the Republic. Caesar also manifested various public work projects to benefit the uh, the Roman populace. To start, Caesar constructed a new harbor, canal, senate house, and the Forum Julium, which you can actually still walk through today. Oh, yeah, it's pretty neat. Even after his death, Caesar kept on giving. In his will, he declared his villa, gardens, and art gallery be made open to the general public. That's cool. Yep. He also left his riches to be divided between the people of Rome, giving a portion of his own money to each citizen. Now, I mean, it's pretty amazing. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. It's absolutely awesome. Pretty cool. Like, think about that. Like, one of our whatever guys just said, hey, keep, keep all my money. 
when I die. You know, Bill Gates is like, here, come explore everything I have. Right, exactly. I want I want all the people of the United States to have an equal part of my well seven billion dollars. You Perfect. know what I mean? We each get a dollar. Right. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, why not? I'll take it. So it is without question that Caesar tried to show the Roman people that he cared. As a result, with the admiration of all of Rome, Julius Caesar could climb up in the ranks and become, again, one of the most influential leaders ever. Um, he also ignited a civil war. Epic. Yep. After Caesar's term as the governor of Gaul had expired, the Roman Senate commanded the Caesar to disband his army and return to Rome. Get your ass back! But in fear that he would be prosecuted for treason and live a shameful life, Caesar decided to uh, rebel against Pompey and keep his pride. Good. This decision caused, caused Caesar to resist the Senate's orders and crossed the Rubicon River one fateful day in 49 BC. He started a violent civil war that would last nearly five years by crossing Italy's border without permission. Damn. However, the single move would change the course of Roman history forever. Marching alongside his mighty and well-trained legions, Caesar chased his enemies down to the bottom of Italy's boot, then later to Greece. Though Caesar seemingly always had an edge on his enemies, his forces were forced to retreat on, uh, on one instance during the Battle of Pharsalus. Pharsalus. It's, yeah. Pharsalus. 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 <laughs> Despite this one-time loss, Pompey ultimately took off and went to Egypt, or fled Egypt, where he was murdered on command of the Egyptian king. After the Civil War ended, Caesar basked in his victories and became more powerful than ever. Okay, when he finally returned to Rome, he appointed himself, again, dictator for life in 44 BC. That's absolutely amazing. You know, I mean, think about that. It's no? crazy. <laughs> <laughs> really? It is, it is insane, though. Oh, man. So here's a, here's a mess. We've got a couple more on Caesar, and we'll keep going. I just, I'm enamored by the guy. Yeah, like, he's, he's just amazing. So Caesar was assassinated in 44 BC in the Curia of the Theater of Pompeii. More than 60 conspirators who feared that Caesar would overthrow the Senate and become king participated in the assassination. 60. It took 60 people to come up with this whole thing. It's ridiculous. He was stabbed 23 times, but only one wound to his aorta was ultimately fatal. So it's like they were just standing around, like, just going, eh, eh. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then one guy was like, ha, and he got him. Like, they were just giving him paper cuts or some shit. Yeah. So the senators were quite sly to have so many people involved in the killing, preventing an, any individual from taking the blame. Okay, if you have all these people together, not one person could be tried for it. Right. To make the story even more tragic, Brutus, and you used this term earlier. It's too brute. Right. The main conspirator, uh, conspirator, conspirator of the assassination, and one time super close friend of, uh, to Caesar here, right? Um, so he was actually the main guy conspiring, right? Right. This betrayal is a central theme in William Shakespeare's famous play, where Caesar's last words translate to, even you, Brutus, which is what? Et tu, Brute. Correct. However, and everyone thinks this, Caesar's actual last words are unknown and widely debated by scholars. It was probably, ah! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ow! <laughs> Stop it! <laughs> 23 times, God yeah, damn it. Yeah, yeah, come on. 22, ow! 23, okay, we're done. Thanks. <laughs> so, yeah, technically, um, Brutus wasn't the one who actually killed him. Hmm. There was a, a multitude of people that were there, and they were just kind of... And, and what they actually did is they, they like, one of the senators actually, like, kind of said, hey, I, I need to talk to you about something, mm -hmm. and, like, brought him over and was talking to him, like, out of the way of everybody because he didn't want anyone seeing it, and then they all just kind of jumped him. Damn. Yeah, it's a bitch move. Yeah. It's Total a, bitch move. Yeah. yeah. So, of course, the Roman people loved Caesar. Simply put, the strength of his support made him such a powerful political dictator that the Senate planned a brutal assassination, right? So how did they explain this to the public? Well, they exclaimed that uh, Caesar was a tyrant and believed that the Republic should be ruled by many, not just one. However, they couldn't convince the devastated Romans uh, and the Roman citizens as, uh, you know, most of them, seriously, they, they, they considered those, um, you know, who were involved in his murder to be traitors. Of course. But they didn't really know. There was speculation. They never really knew. Okay. So obviously his death marked the end of the Republic. Um, now, this is pretty cool, too. And then, then we'll move on from Caesar. I'm sorry. I'm all over Caesar's nuts right now. I get it. So he was the first Roman to, be, uh, to become deified, which is amazing. Oh, wow. So shortly after Caesar's assassination, a large comet flashed in the sky, leading many Romans to believe it symbolized Caesar's divine ascension into the heavens. That comet, dubbed Caesar's Comet, also Citus Lulium, or the Julian Star, um, actually may have been the brightest comet ever recorded. 
Whoa. Yeah, so I mean, think about how bright that was and like he just died and being interred and all of a sudden this thing flashes across the sky and they didn't really know about stuff. Yeah. You know, immediately they're like, oh shit, he just went to heaven and run that bitch now. You know what I mean? <laughs> I am the dictator for life right. here now. <laughs> exactly. So in ancient Roman culture, uh, deification was the highest honor and it was not given out to just anyone. Caesar was the first Roman to become deified in history. So what does it mean to become deified? If a deceased person uh, person were uh, considered worthy, the Senate would vote to decide if they could um, should be regarded as divine and ascend to a godlike level. Hmm. Okay, so following Caesar, several other uh, beloved emperors and some of their family members earned this prestigious and noble title following their deaths. Before his death, Caesar had designated his nephew Octavian as his sole heir. Right, we talked about Octavian earlier. Right, um, at the ripe age of eighteen. Octavian, later later known by the name Augustus, oh, ho, ho. yeah, he stepped in to fill his uncle's shoes, and he was well received by the public. They loved him, of course they did. His uncle was Julius fucking Caesar. Yeah, you know. So it was widely believed to have been an intelligent play by Octavian in initiating the deification of his deceased uncle. Okay, so basically he's like, listen, I want my my uncle, this amazing person, to be deified. Right, and they're like, okay. But it wasn't just a selfless act, okay? In doing so, Octavian uh, designated Julius Caesar as a god. And since he was family, he too would be considered most excellent. Uh, Either way, having a god for an uncle certainly didn't hurt his reputation when he became the first Roman emperor in 27 BC. It just so happens that Augustus uh, Augustus became deified after his death. That makes sense. See what I'm saying? Yeah. So he's like, listen, yeah, you need to do this for my uncle, man. He's a great dude. And then when he dies, he's like, <laughs> I'm getting deified. You know what I mean? Right. So it's pretty cool. All right. Enough about the salad guy. Uh, anyway, I'm kidding, by the way. Uh, the salad was actually named after Cesar Cardini, an Italian immigrant restaurateur. Ooh. Yes. And now you know. And now you know. And if you don't know. Now you know, motherfucker. <laughs> baby, baby. Come on, you got to do like this. <laughs> it's, my, it's my biggie. <laughs> Sorry. So Rome prospered during the following 200 years, ruling over a vast area that spanned from Britain and the Atlantic coast of Europe in the north and west to North Africa and the Middle East in the south and east. They were all over that joint. Crazy. When Marcus Aurelius passed away in 180 AD, the Pax Romana, a period of peace, ended. Rome's slow and steady decline was caused by a confluence of economic issues, barbarian incursions, internal unrest, territorial uprisings, and uh, uprisings. And a lack of effective leadership. They just could not get their shit straight. Sounds familiar. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you know. After 300 years of persecution, Christianity was finally recognized as the sole state religion in 380 AD. The Roman Empire broke into, into two around the end of the 4th century AD. In what is now Turkey, the newly constructed metropolis of Constantinople served as the base for the East, which prospered and eventually developed into the enduring Byzantine Empire. Okay. Oh. Rome, the Western world's capital, kept just slipping away, though. No. Rome just wasn't doing doing all that well. So Rome was captured by... Bar- by bar- 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 <laughs> My mouth said, fuck that word. <laughs> they were captured by barbarians in 410 AD. Got it out. The Eastern Empire attacked, uh, was attacked, but was forced to leave after... Or, or they did attack. They... Should I say they defended themselves, okay? Right, right. But were forced to leave after being unable to restore order. By the end of the 5th century AD, the Roman Empire in the West had disintegrated. Italy reverted to being a patchwork of city-states during the following millennia, with Rome, the seat of the Catholic Church, becoming the most potent of them all. The Dark Ages was the name of this protracted era of peaceful stagnation. So that's what started the Dark Ages. Oh, oh. So basically, it, it's kind of like um, Italy broke into its own states, Okay, so it was kind of like, uh, you know, uh, kind of like the U.S., right. where it's, you know, a country, but everybody's kind of doing their own thing, right? you know, and it didn't work out too well. So mm-hmm. Italy saw prosperity once more in the 14th century when city-states like Florence, mm-hmm. God, I love it, Milan, Pisa, Genoa, and Venice, aka Venice, emerged as major commercial hubs. As a result, Italy became Europe's most important cultural hub due to an expansion in trade and prosperity. They're getting it. Oh, yeah. Getting it, getting it, getting it good. People like Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, Dante, Machiavelli, and Galileo, among others, changed the realms of art, literature, politics, and science with the help of wealthy patrons. Of course. (laughs) Gotta have those donors, buddy. Yep. 
In addition, Italy and Europe were presented to the rest of the world by Italian explorers like Marco Polo. Marco Polo. <laughs> and well, Christopher Columbus and that one. You guys can say and think whatever you want. I mean, I know he did some shit, but he still did some good shit, too. So yeah. we'll just put it that way. Break a few eggs, make an omelet. Yeah, I guess. Uh, we're not even going to get into any <coughs> Other things. <coughs> we're, yeah, we're not going to get into it. Anyway, until the 16th century, when trade routes shifted away from the Mediter- Mediterranean and the Protestant re- uh, Reformation caused the Catholic Church, which had its headquarters in Rome, to lose its sway over much of Northern Europe, Italy remained a significant economic and political power. Italy killing it. The different Italian city-states were weakened, making them open to invasion by Spain, France, and Austria. Son of a bitch. Ah. Until the 19th century, Italy was a patchwork of principalities governed by proxy uh, by other European countries. Okay. Damn. Yeah. So other countries, yeah, it was like literally they had somebody like in a different country that was running just these individual states, Hmm. city-states. Napoleon, the leader of France, backed the unification of Italy as a strategy to create a buffer state against his many opponents. Which is actually kind of smart. Yeah, it's kind of smart. Also sounds familiar as well, too. It does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm, 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 mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so uh, Italian patriot uh, Giuseppe Garibaldi led a popular movement that, with France's support, took control of much of Italy in 1861 and concluded in 1870 with the fall of Rome and the nation's complete unification. Damn. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The, dude, it was not. Everyone thinks like the fall of Rome happened in like the 16th or 17th century. Yeah. Technically, no. It yeah. was like literally the like the mid to eight uh, late um, 1900s yeah, wasn't or 19th century, not yeah. 1900s. That'd That's be weird. Crazy. Yeah, it's wild. In 1919, a, pol- a politician named Benito Mussolini. <laughs> and I'll be the first to say it. You could say it with me. You ready? Oh, you <laughs> fuck, fuck that, that guy. guy. Yeah, he can eat a bag of dicks. So he started a movement that called for restoring Italy as a great power because he was dissatisfied that his country had made few achievements despite winning the First World War. Right? Doesn't sound too bad. He's like, come on. My country needs to be better than that. Right? Yeah. Right. Mussolini led his fascist supporters on a march toward Rome in 1922 because he was tired of electoral politics and wanted to take direct control of the government through a coup. However, the Italian king was so terrified that he gave up and enabled Mussolini to take over as the country's ultimate leader. What a bitch. Yeah. Imagine being the king of Italy and Mussolini comes in like, I'm, uh, I'm going to take your stuff. And he goes, okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? Just gets up, hands him the crown, walks away. <sighs> Mussolini spent the following 20 years strengthening his position of authority and advancing the Italian economy. Still, he never, never gave up on the dream of making Italy again a significant power. Mussolini, who went by the moniker Il Duce, which, which means leader. No, it means poop. Du- Dookie? Yeah. <laughs> With him? Yes. Yes. <laughs> he had aspirations of founding a new Roman Empire. He indulged his desire for conquest by conquering Ethiopia and Albania in the 1930s. Boy, it sure sounds an awful lot like something else that's going on. Hmm. So weird. Hmm. Hmm. Always doomed to repeat these things. Anyway, yep. Italy initially remained neutral when the Second World War started. However, Mussolini eagerly joined Hitler, a fellow fascist and longstanding ally in the war effort, and hurried to invade Greece, the Balkans, and North Africa once it became, quote, clear that Germany would win thanks to the fall of France. I'm going to stay on my side, but as soon as you start winning, I'm going to come over on your side. Don't yeah. worry. I got your back, buddy. Fuck that guy, too. <laughs> Fuck them both. Ugh. Anyway. Oh, I just break. Oh, anyway, so Italy swiftly discovered that it could not sustain its military position and had had to ask Germany for assistance due to being overextended and unprepared for such a massive undertaking. Bit off way more than he could fucking chew. Mm-hmm. Mussolini soon anticipated that the Allies would take over control of the Mediterranean, North Africa, and ultimately Italy. Mussolini attempted but failed to establish a puppet state in northern Italy as he fled Rome. A super displeased and pissed, pissed off Hitler left behind Il Duce and his mistress before they were arrested and killed by the Italian partisans. Yes, with stones. Oh, we'll talk. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, boy. I loved this part. I had to have it in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so Mussolini and his mistress uh, Petacci uh, were removed from the house and driven to the small village of Giulia, Giuliano di Mezegra on the shores of Lake Como. They were ordered to stand in front of a stone wall at the entrance to uh, Villa Belmonte, where both uh, both of them were executed by machine gun fire. The identity of the trigger man remains a point of contention, but it was likely a uh, communist partisan commander, Walto Adasio. 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 
huh, I'll diss you. So if it was that guy, I'd like to buy him a beer. I thought they beat him with like a bunch of rocks. Oh, and shit. it's coming. Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> Better. There's no uncertainty, however, uh, about what happened to Mussolini's body in the hours after his execution. In the pre-dawn hours of April 29th, the corpses of Mussolini, Patacci, and 14 other fascists were placed in a truck and dumped like garbage in Milan's, uh, oh boy, Piazale, uh, Piazale Loreto, a deeply symbolic public square for the anti-fascist forces. Eight months earlier, just eight months earlier, fascists uh, acting under orders uh, from Hitler's, you know, SS or whatever, they publicly displayed the bodies of 15 executed part, uh, partisans. Damn. So, like, it's a very important spot there, right? So, yeah. like, th- this was heartbreaking for them. As the sun, and they dumped their bodies there. That's so, it was, like, kind of, like, eloquent, yeah. you know? As the sun rose on the square of the 15 martyrs, that's what they dubbed it, residents of Milan hurled insults and vegetables at the dictator's corpse before kicking, beating, and spitting upon it. Finally, one badass woman, deciding Mussolini just wasn't dead enough for her, emptied a pistol into the dictator's body and shouted, quote, five shots for my five assassinated sons. The crowd then strung the bodies of Mussolini, Patacci, and the other fascists by their feet from the rafters of a gasoline station in the corner of the square. That's so fucking good. That's so great. That is, dude, definitively fuck around and find out. Jeez. You know what I mean? Amazing. So awesome. So Italy declared itself a republic and dissolved the monarchy following World War II. Italy joined the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, rebuilt its economy with aid from the Marshall Plan, and developed a powerful ally in the European European Union with the help of the United States. As a result, Italy is currently one of Europe's wealthiest and most democratic countries. I love it. I loved it. I loved it there. I would go back. I would honestly, I would love to. I was looking at houses while we were there. Fuck it. Not like I, we didn't actually physically go look, but I was like looking online. Online, yeah. And I was like, oh, that'd be awesome. Yeah. But there's so many, like, there's so much red tape and stuff. Yeah, but we got to get one with a vineyard, though. That's all that matters. A vineyard? A vineyard. Do you know how to. Do you know how to grow vines? Yeah. Do you? Yeah, I actually do. Do you? Do you? Yeah. Really? Yeah. And how do you know how to do this? Because I've grown stuff. <laughs> I've watched YouTube. It'll be all right. It'll be good. <laughs> if it means living in Italy, I'll do whatever it has to do. We'll figure it out, right? Yeah, we'll yeah, figure we'll it figure out. We'll figure it out, right. But it is. It's amazing, and that's pretty much like that's the the history kind of in a nutshell. You know what I mean? And it's crazy history. It's so wild. Oh, look at me. I'm in a nutshell. <laughs> look at me. I'm in a nutshell. So according to a rather interesting CNN travel news article, um, Italy does 10 things better than anyone else in the fucking world. Yeah, they do. And... I'm going to have to agree with this. First of all, flattery. Depending on whether or not you think the occasional cat call is flattering, you'll find Italians are aggressively complimentary of friends and beautiful strangers alike. Flattery is a historical tool for disarming and diffusing, which is the fulcrum on which Italian society teeters. I love that. Mm -hmm. Luigi Barzini writes uh, in The Italians, quote, The people have always employed such arts offensively to gain advantages, destroy rivals, and conquer power and wealth. And defensively, as the squid uses ink to blind and confound powerful men, dictators, and tyrants. But you'll likely, uh, you know, you'll, you'll probably just notice the cat calls there, right? I'm going to whoop your ass. Hey, man, you know you got some really pretty teeth? Yeah. <laughs> Wait, hold on. You've got some beautiful eyes. <laughs> man, I'm going to, I'm going to, let's step outside. Hey, I really like your shoes. Come on. <laughs> it's horrible. Sorry. Fonz shows up. <laughs> hey. Hey. <laughs> I didn't even think about it. <laughs> uh, which is funny because he's Jewish, actually, isn't he? Yeah. Isn't he? Yeah. 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 All right. So hot baths, right? So if flattery doesn't get you out of your clothes, woohoo! <laughs> the peninsula's 380 spa sites will offer healing mud and bubbles. Boiling as much beneath the uh, the surface as its people, Italy pioneered the first uh, the world's first large scale spas, according um, or exporting them as the they colonized Europe. Watery therapies include island baths such as those on vac- uh, volcanic. Ischia? Yeah, it's like a type of uh, spring. Oh, okay. Yeah. Tuscan Hot Springs, Mountain Baths in B- Bormio, and Lake Agarda's Thermal Park. Just drinking mineral uh, mineral rich water in some places is uh, reputed to be healthy. So convinced is the Italian government of the healing power of hot springs and geothermal mud packs that it covers the cost of some therapies for its citizens. Mm-hmm. So if you're sick or if you have like a bad disease or whatever, if that's a therapeutic Come, situation. It's the, just the more I read this, the more I'm like, I'm selling my house. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm out. That's it. <laughs> I mean, I'm, not, I'm not going on. Let's go. Yeah, let's, let's go. <laughs> All right. So cursing. Oh, yeah. Hey, be it in Italian or any other language, the accent of native Italy turns any expl- expletive into a blunt force instrument. And man, I love it so mm-hmm. much. 
rhythmic staccato and with an almost operatic legato that fuses syllables like a hammer on guitar note. Swearing here is performance art. It is inspired mainly by pigs, um, anatomical e- uh, exit points, and promiscuous women. Yeah. So basically that's where their cuss words come from. Mm-hmm. Italian profanities, which vary by region, sound equal parts dramatic, angry, and comical. Powered by the passion uh, passion characteristic of the Italian people, their results stun, intimidate, and even charm their recipients, sometimes all at once. So now, I'm sure our passengers would love to learn some Italian swear words. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so here we go. So this one is uh, caso or mincia. Hmm. That is fuck. Hey. And they say when your intention is to indicate surprise, anger, disappointment, and in some cases, appreciation. So you're like, you see someone's shoes, you're like, hey, caso. You know, I like your shoes, you know. <laughs> then there's testa di caso or testa di muncia, which is dickhead or prick. So testa di caso, that's dickhead. Oh, yeah. It's testicle, I guess. I don't know if that's how, like, whatever. I Maybe. Okay. Then there's casone or mincione. Idiot. <laughs> Casano. Caso. <laughs> Fuck. Idiot. <laughs> then there's cavallo, which is holy crap. Okay, uh, vafanculo. You've heard that one, right? When they go like this under the chin uh, or the, that Part thing the right thumb. there. Yeah. Uh, va, uh, vafanculo, which means fuck you or fuck off. Vafanculo, caso, right? Yeah. Uh, por- uh, I'm going to say it's porca because usually porcha would be C- double C's. Yeah. So I think it's porca put- <laughs> putana or porca troia or porca miseria, which is bloody hell, damn, or damn it. Hmm. Okay. Bloody hell, porca putana. Like if you came in and stepped on my shoes, you know? Gotcha. Caso, Porto Bucana. <laughs> so good. <laughs> then there's merda, which is just shit. Uh, then there's figlio di... Uh, oh, my God. Figlio di putana, son of a bitch. Oh. Figlio du, di, di putana. Say it with me, passengers. Figlio di putana, son of a bitch. This is, this is going to be like an ASMR thing. All right, I'm going to need you guys to you after me. <laughs> it's going to be figlio di putana. De putana. You gotta say it though. You know what I mean? You gotta it's say it. Like, p- p- d- 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 <laughs> <laughs> is there a potato in there? I don't know. Porky pig show up. What happened? <laughs> now, this is an easy one. Stranzo. Oh. It's just asshole. Perfect. Stranzo. Say it with me, passengers. Stranzo. There you go. In your car, you should be yelling these right now or wherever you're at. Stranzo. Yeah, at work. Yes. <laughs> it's fucking behind it. That's Stranzo. Stranzo. And especially if they don't speak Italian, because that's going to be the best. I don't know. There's going to be a few of them here. will be like, are, are you hungry? <laughs> <laughs> then there's Madonna or Madonna Santa, which is basically mother. That's what Madonna, the, the word Madonna means mother. Yeah. So, yes, Madonna, the singer, was named after the Madonna, which is the mother. Got ya. Gotcha. Got ya. Then there's Cepale. What a pain in the ass. I like that one. But it's so short, but it means yeah. so much. <laughs> Cepale. What a pain in the ass. When something bothers or bores you. <laughs> then there's Cefigata. That's awesome. Cefigata. Not really a uh, cuss word, but it's cool. And then I love this one. Morto di figa. Say it with me, folks. Morto di figa. One more time. Morto di figa. That's a poon hound. <laughs> Ah, I love it When you mention a man who really enjoys To ask women for sex in a compulsive way A poon hound A fucking creep, that's That's, what that is Alright Then there's, oh boy, this is a tough one Uh, Ricongla, oh boy Ricong, rincoglianito Rincoglianito Or rimbambito Num nuts (laughs) (laughs) Why is that one so much longer? I don't know uh, oh boy, this is one too. Rampa Caglione or Caga Ah Caga 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 Whatever we use the first one. That's ball breaker or ball buster. Huh. Then there's Lecha Lecha Culo, which is an ass licker. <laughs> Lecha Culo. Uh, Caglione, we said that one. I'm an idiot. I guess it's another one. Uh, Peso de Merda. Piece of shit. <laughs> Say it with me, everyone. Peso de Merda. Piece of shit. That's so funny. And this one is super fucked. Last one here. Cornuto. That's a cuckold. And if you don't know what that is, um, I'm going to just, you go ahead and just research that on Google. Yeah, have fun. Yeah. yeah. Just look up cuckold. Yeah. That's C U C K O L D. Anyway, moving on. So they also are known for uh, their beaches. 
with 7,400 kilometers or 4,600 miles of coastline. I mean, it's literally all coast except for just at the very yeah. top, you know. Italy boasts the most beaches in Europe, in Europe, and 27 marine parks. Summer temperatures peak in many places at just below 30 degrees Celsius or 86 degrees Fahrenheit, which is amazing. Perfect. Compared with the mid 20s, okay, um, uh, mid 20, oh, mid 20s uh, Celsius or 70 degrees in France and Portugal. It's like swimming in tropical waters, minus the sharks and trinket hawkers. Regarding beaches, it's a tough choice between blinding white dunes, pebbles, and even turf uh, turf shores. But 248 Italian beaches have been awarded blue flag status for clear waters and unspoiled sands. Get the fuck out of here. Yeah. So cool. if you like beaches, if you want to go to, you got to go to Italy. Yeah. Period. That's cool. it. Place to go. I do hear Por- uh, Portugal's awesome, though. Yeah. Uh, we had a bunch of friends that went over to the uh, the Indian wedding or whatever, mm-hmm. that they stopped off at Portugal on their way home. Really? To, uh, was it Lisbon? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it Lisbon and Portugal? Yeah. yeah. I always thought it was in Spain for some reason, but I think it's Portugal, right? Not Lisbon, Spain. Are you sure? Yeah. No. They went to Portugal. I don't know. Maybe. God, we're stupid. I know it's part of that. If I don't have notes in front of me, I'm like Ron Burgundy. <laughs> I'm Ron Burgundy? Oh, no, it is Portugal. Aha! Huh. I was oh. thinking of Ohio. That's the Lisbon I was thinking of. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that yeah. what it was? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> They're also known for their changing governments. Oh, really? Italians tear through regimes like their sports cars do dinosaur juice. That's gasoline for the rest of you. <laughs> Since the end of World War II, Italy has established 63 governments under 39 prime ministers, 42 if you count Silvio uh, Berlusconi's three full terms. And only one has lasted five years. <laughs> Fearing the rise of another Mussolini, Italy's constitutional system years ago provided for a weak executive branch that required majorities in both legislative houses to get anything done. That, combined with an already fractured political landscape of small opposed parties, puts Italy's average MPG, months per government, barely over 12. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah, but they, they're uh, they're killing it, though. They're doing awesome. Um, also, they're known for their volcanoes. Yeah. Ten active volcanoes allow Italy's geology to vent the way voting gives release to its citizens. Yikes. This is their article I'm reading, by the way. So the country's and Europe's largest volcano, this is Europe's largest volcano, mm-hmm. is uh, Mount Etna in Sicily. The world's second most active volcano after Hawaii's uh, Moana Loa. Um, so it's Hawaii's second. Right. Think about that. I never thought or knew that Italy had like the biggest. I know they had a bunch of volcanoes, but I didn't realize that they actually that uh, Mount Etna was still active. Yeah. So Etna's spectacular eruptions, soot, blackened scenery, lava flows, and extensive caves draw more than a million tourists annually. It le- leads TripAdvisor's top ten must-see volcanoes uh, list and four other Italian spouters, including Mount Vesuvius. Oh. Heard of that one? Oh yeah. We know what happened there. And if you don't, well, it erupted and Pompeii was gone. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty. That's it in a nutshell. That's me in a nutshell. <laughs> um, Etna is uh, Mount Etna here is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. We've talked about what those are. Yeah. It joins three other Italian volcanoes, including the I- I- Aeolian Islands of uh, Volcano, <laughs> Lipari, and Stromboli, known as the Mediterranean's Lighthouse for its spectacular eruptions. And that's the, another reason why the, their food is so good because it explodes in your mouth. <clears throat> Speaking of. They're also known for their desserts. Oh, yeah. Look at that little lead way. Yeah, it was good. Yeah. So apple pie is good and all, and it's always the right time for a sticky slice of baklava. Do love me some baklava. Oh, baklava. But nothing beats an Italian dessert case for sheer volume and variety of treats. So much is made of the peninsula's food, the usual suspects being pizza, pasta, and antipasta. But the real stars of Italian cuisine are their gelato. Mmm, I had pistachio gelato when I was over there. Oh, yeah. Oh. This is, this is good. Dude. Oh. I mean, I'm just sitting here eating. It's the, just the creamiest. It's like if ice cream just, I don't know, was actually cream. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's so good. Tiramisu. Mm. Love a good tiramisu. Um, our boy uh, Gerte out in uh, at uh, Mia Bella uh-huh. out on, in Cleveland here. If you're ever in that area, stop over at that restaurant. It's an Italian restaurant. Amazing. Best tiramisu I've ever had in my life. Really? Other than my wife's. Fair enough. Yep. Also, cannoli. Yeah, I would Love do, a good cannoli. I would do a lot of bad things for a cannoli. Yep. Neapolitan, uh, biscotti, spumoni, I love spumoni, yeah. uh, tartufa, zeppole, and so much more. You guys hungry yet? You um, listening? To- <laughs> starving. <laughs> Mouth watering. Italy has nearly as many signature desserts as, as it has uh, governments. <laughs> Italian confectioners work in all media, too, combining cakes, cookies, and creams, both iced and otherwise, to create the world's most vast, tastiest arsenal of desserts. Ironically, Italians don't even really eat their desserts. Most often preferring a piece of fruit or uh, maybe just a small piece of chocolate after a meal. 
Yeah, I did. I didn't notice that too. So now caving, caving's another one that's pretty popular over there, and that uh, they do, as you would say, better than anyone else. Ooh. Rich and crumbly uh, sieve, sieve, damn it, sieve-like karstic landscapes, man. Italy is one of the most cave-pocked countries on the planet, with more than thirty-five thousand caves above ground and thousands more underwater. That's crazy. Yeah. Grato, uh, oh boy, Grata Gigante holds the Guinness World Record for the most extensive accessible cave on Earth at 850 meters or uh, 2,788 feet wide with 500 steps that descend 100 meters or 325 or th- 328 feet into the Earth. That's insane. And you won't catch me in any of those. <laughs> nope. Other notable caves include the Blue Grotto on Capri, where Emperor Tiberius loved to swim. Inside the Grotto del Vento, winds whip uh, through its um, to its trails at 40 kilometers an hour. Damn. Yeah, that's, what is that, like 60 miles an hour? Or, yeah, 60 miles an hour, yeah. roughly, something like that? Yeah. I don't know. That's math. It's probably not even, I don't know. No, it's pretty close to that, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Hey, look at me. Hey. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> woo Thank you. Oh, All right. Also, sports cars. Eliciting more turns per head than even its fashion models do. Italy's catalog of exotic land jets it's, uh, is what Porsche drivers dream about. What began as a race car manufacturer in the 1930s has become the standard bearer for, um, bearer for uh, aspirational autos. Ew. In 2012, Ferrari sold just 7,000 cars, but booked $3 billion in revenue. Well, yeah, when you sell each car for fucking 30, 40, 50 million dollars, yeah. that's kind of what happens. It's not a bad concept. No. <laughs> Meanwhile, Lamborghini may be owned by German Audi now, but the hips are still all Italian. Oh, the hips don't lie. Oh. <laughs> so Pagani, Alfa Romeo, Maserati, these names are just sex on wheels, and man, are they beautiful. Yeah, they are. I would, oh, Alfa Romeo, dude. The old school Alfa Romeos. Mm-hmm. I'm not a big fan of the new ones. No, I'm not a big fan of the old, new ones either. Nice old Maserati. Ah. See, <clears throat> that's the one thing when it comes to European cars. I don't, I'm not a big European car guy, but I have always been enamored by British um, luxury cars like Rolls Royce and stuff like yeah. that um, and Aston Martin and stuff oh, yeah. like that like dude I love that's like my favorite car in the world is a DB9 or a DB12 the, is that uh, the one that uh, James Austin Bond. Powers yeah oh yeah, yeah, yeah Austin Powers had one of James Bond yeah, yeah, yeah both of them yeah well, he's had like a different car in every freaking yeah, yeah. And, and you gotta make sure it has rockets yes. that shoot out and a machine gun behind the headlamp oil slicks in the back yes yep. and, and can go, go underwater as yes. well yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. turn into a boat or yeah. submarine yeah. Yeah. or even fly yeah Fuck it. Where is Q at? He should be doing this for us, right? Ferrari actually makes a flying car. <clears throat> oh, I'm not surprised. Yep. Yeah. They're like, what? Look what I can do. Hey, mm-hmm. Michelin. No, who was it? No, it was uh, Da Vinci, wasn't it? Yeah. That, uh, was it Da Vinci that, uh, or was it Michelangelo that uh, did the, he did a concept and drew a concept of a helicopter. Oh, that was uh, uh, Leonardo Da Vinci. It was Da Vinci. Yeah, he yeah, actually yeah. made it as well, too. It's a little, uh, it, you actually see it in Hudson Hawk. It's the little uh, fucking spiral yeah. thing or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Love him. Love him. Oh, yes. Yeah. So Italy uh, doesn't even crack the top twenty in global auto production, right? Mm-hmm. Still, four out of your uh, out of your league supercars that cover more adolescent male bedroom walls than Kate Upton. I don't even know why they wrote that. No other country can outtrace Italy. Truthfully, I mean, like you think about their like when you think of expensive mm-hmm. classic cars, Italy. Yeah, they do. It. I'm, come on, man. And the best part is too, like no one was able to outpace them in anything except for Ford in like the seventies when they were doing the whole fucking GT shit or whatever. Yeah. Well, like, yeah, uh, Ford, only Ford came out with, uh, what was it? Was it Shelby? Yeah. That came out and they're the ones that actually beat, uh, was it the Ferrari? Ferrari. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's a whole movie about that. There's two of them actually. There's yeah. one that has, uh, what's his face? Uh, uh, DJ Marky Mark in it. I think, right. Mark Wahlberg. I think. Did Mark Wahlberg or Matt Damon? I actually think it's both of them. Matt Damon. They're both in that movie. Okay. And then they came out with a documentary called GT vs. Ferrari. Oh, yeah? And it's fucking, they're both amazing. I watched both of them. I love Yeah, them. I had to check those out. Such a good movie. All right, so let's start talking about some creepy stuff here. You know yeah, how we right, do it. Yeah, we got right. into that history. We know a little bit. We know about Julius Caesar, that he did not create that shitty salad dressing. You know what I mean? We've learned about this. <laughs> We've learned about this. No, listen, you can have your opinion. It's just wrong. Yeah. You know, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> So beginning in Sicily in 1347, the first significant outbreak of the bubonic plague in Italy extended to Venice by 1348. Okay. Can you can you say that one more time? Beginning in Sicily in 1347, the first significant outbreak of the bubonic plague in Italy extended right there, to right, Venice. Right there. Uh-huh. Bubonic. You said bubonic. <laughs> it's bubonic. <laughs> it's not a boob, though. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's bubonic. <laughs> it's so funny when you say it. Bu- bubonic. 
Well, I had to say it so I can get slapped by my wife, I guess. Ah, gotcha. <laughs> yeah, I was like, that boobs in here somewhere. About half the people in Venice actually passed away from this. And we've discussed this. We talked about, you know, the whole Black Plague and everything yeah. else in our past episodes. Go back and listen to that. Yes. Uh, Florence actually lost uh, two-thirds of their population, I believe. Jeez. Yeah, it was rough. The Venetians learned a lot about the spread of the, dis- the disease from this. Through observation, they learned how the illness spread and how individuals and ships brought the plague into the region. The necessity to distinguish healthy people from the sick and dead plague victims was recognized by officials. Hmm. Therefore, they prepared two areas outside of the main city with sizable burial trenches for the bodies. Gross. That's crazy. The two holes, however, quickly became overflowing as a result of the mounting number of dead bodies. The city started moving large numbers of dead bodies to St. Erasmo and the neighborhood of St. Martino di Strata on two islands in the lagoon as a result in order to handle the overflow of dead bodies. That's crazy. The Lazaretto idea was created by the Venetians and Venetians in the early 1400s. This is a facility or hospital set up for the isolation of sick and possibly sick people. Okay. The first Lazaretto, or Lazaretto sorry, uh, was located in the tiny island of Lazaretto Vecchio in the lagoon. Now, little side note here you know what vecchio means Mm -mm. okay well first of all it's my uh my wife's grandmother's maiden name oh her last name is vecchio interesting Uh uh-huh we went over there and we're seeing all these signs and stuff that say like castle to this and you know whatever and my wife looks over at our tour guide and goes oh so what what about vecchio what does vecchio mean and he's like i'm old (laughs) (laughs) i was like your grandmother's last name is old So basically, when you look at this and it says uh, uh, Lazaretto Vecchio, it's old Lazaretto, uh, old old island or old whatever Lazaretto means. Yeah. So more than 1,500 skeletal plague corpses were discovered during an excavation on the island by archaeologists. The victims were buried in pits. The scientists think there are still thousands of others buried beneath the earth. From 16th century Venetian chronicler, uh, quote, the sick lay three or four in a bed. Workers collected the dead and threw them in the graves all day without a break. Often the dying ones and the ones too sick to move or talk were taken for dead and thrown on the piled corpses. So that means some of them that weren't even dead yet were just tossed there to die. Yeah, that's ridiculous. Uh, But it's okay. That's one of those. Do the ends justify the means? Because you've got so many people and you don't want everyone else getting sick. Right. You know, and you're a small. I don't know, man. It sucks. So several islands, especially uh, Paveglia, uh, function as quarantines and graveyards for large numbers of bodies during the subsequent plague epidemics in the 1570s and 1630s. Barges were occasionally, and you heard when I said plague epidemics. Yeah, multiple. Right. Yes, there were multiple. Uh, barges were occasionally required to transport the bodies. Anyone exhibiting even the slightest symptoms were swiftly snatched from their families and society and transported to the island. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just Bye. a flesh wound. <laughs> It's a sniffle, I swear. It's a sniffle. I have allergies. Yeah, there's so many beautiful flowers. <laughs> Once there, they could have died or very rarely made a full recovery throughout the quarantine period of up to 40 days. To stop the disease's spread, authorities burned thousands of dead on Paveglia Island. Yikes. The island was taken over by the Magistrate of Health in 1777, who turned it into a checkpoint. As a precaution against sickness, every ship or boat entering Venice had to pass a stringent check. Two ships went down to the 1790s, and officials discovered plague cases on board. As a result, Paveglia Island was used as a quarantine colony once more for about 10 years, up until the hospital's closure in the early 1800s. The government converted the island structures into residences for the mentally ill at the turn of the 20th century. As time passed, disturbing tales regarding the treatment and experiments on the patients made their way to the public. We've heard this story before. Mm Mm-hmm. Some claim that the doctor killed himself in order to avoid being held responsible for the gruesome human experimentation he carried out on the patients. According to other legends, he was haunted by the hellish spirits of the islanders and suicide was his only way off. Another account claims that he was forced off the tower by someone or something. In 1968, the staff and patients eventually left the island. Except for what are purported to be a population of tortured ghosts, and has remained empty up until this point. With time, the remaining structures, including a church, a hospital, and a boat shelter, they're all just falling apart. The government attempted to auction off the island in 2014. They were unsuccessful when they only the only bid they received was a mere seven hundred and four thousand dollars. Yeah, for an island. Yep, dude, I'd buy it now. Do it. <laughs> Not that one though, but there's a little bit of plague issues there. But seven hundred and four thousand. If it was seven hundred and four dollars, I might be able to do it. Yeah. Right, Patreon? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! 
Naturally, a location associated with so many different ways of dying has endured in pop- a popular culture in this day. The island has been featured on the television programs Ghost Adventures, of course, and Scariest Places on Earth. Additionally, it has served as the focus of fiction and graphic books, but of course, I mean, that thing sounds nasty. Yeah. Paveglia Island will probably remain a mysterious presence until it can once again support local businesses and residents. Still, it ranks among the most haunted places on the planet. Yeah. Pretty wild. Then, let's talk about the catacombs of San Gennaro. Oh. Oh. The greatest Christian underground necropolis in southern Italy is located on the Caparamonte hillside in Naples, Italy. That's pretty good. Thank you. The catacombs of San Gennaro are a cemetery complex with about 3,000 graves and are named for St. Oh, boy. Gennarius? Gennaro in Italian, I guess. Okay. Who was once interred there. The second century CE is when the earliest entryway was built. One of the most spectacular archaeological finds in the area is this hollowed site of burial and worship, which contains some of the early Christian um, frescoes and mosaics. Yes. Yes. So we're talking about uh, catacombs. Like, they're everywhere. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, everywhere. I only really knew, I guess there's one in there's one in Rome, mm-hmm. um, uh, which I don't, I'm sure they're all over the place. Yeah, there's so many of them. Yeah. Right? It indicates the location was first used as a pagan temple and graveyard. Later, when Christianity grew, Christians started utilizing the complex and extending it. From Selene, quote, in the oldest part of the cemetery complex, pagan art and culture is mixed with that of early Christianity. Apollo and maybe Diana are magically transformed to Adam and Eve. Bacchus lends his emblems to Christ and the good pastor starts to appear. As well, the deer, the lamb, the peacock, the cross, angels and gods living together. Yeah, there's a lot of really cool pictures with those too, which we'll make sure we post up on the socials. There's yeah. a lot of really cool like um, like mosaics and stuff that you still see down in the, the catacombs there. Like We go more in depth on it, but they're really freaking pretty and very conspiratorial. Oh. Oh. <laughs> in ancient Italy, funeral rites were significant. Burying the dead close to the living was against the law then. As a result, they chose locations for the tombs that were far enough from the city walls to allow for frequent visits to the departed. And you can go back and listen to our um, Catacombs of Paris episode where we talk about that as well. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, the Capitamante Mountains, soft volcanic uh, tufo (laughs) stone or tough stone, made it the perfect location for the catacombs construction. The rock also solidified and became stable after drying outdoors. The catacombs of San Gennaro's survival um, for almost two centuries is proof of this. Damn. Mm-hmm. Naples has significantly expanded over time and currently includes six, uh, 60,300 60, square feet of underground tombs near its center. Jesus. Yeah, dude. Like, it's ridiculous what's underneath there. That's wild. Oh, I got to go to Naples now. Their graves reveal the deceased wealth and social standing. Uh, persons with limited resources used small crypts and modest crevices in the walls uh, of uh, or flooring. The wealthy generally had larger tombs with domes or arches or a cross, uh, uh, oh, arcosolia, mm-hmm. arcosolia, very, very nice, with frescoes or mosaics. The graves that initially housed the bodies are located just beneath the domes. Typically, the decorations contained the person's image and acted as mementos of the people. The remains in each tomb used to uh, used uh, to be sealed by marble slabs. Mm-hmm. All right. The catacombs also housed about five hundred sarcophagi. Sarcophagi. <laughs> off a guy. <laughs> you want me to whack a guy off a guy? You want me to whack off a guy? <laughs> sarcophagi. What a weird word. Such a weird word when it's plural. Yes. And those are 500 sarcophaguses. <laughs> or stone coffins. The lower vestibule and top vestibule make up the San Gen- uh, Gennaro catacombs. The bottom vestibule, uh, vestibule, damn it, is the earliest part, as was mentioned. Around 200 CE, it might have first existed as the pagan burial of a wealthy family. St. <laughs> uh, Agrippinus, right? Agrip- Agrippinus, mm-hmm. all right. Mm-hmm. Saint, I grip my nuts. Whatever <laughs> was inter- interred there in uh, the year 400 CE. The demand for tombs near uh, Agrippinus rose because Christians at the time considered it a blessing to be close to a saint, and the first stage of expansion followed. Saint Agrippinus had uh, a basilica constructed out of the tough rock. Behind the altar is a stone bishop's chair, which has a hole in the middle where worshippers may reach out. And touch Saint Agrippinus's tomb. Yeah, they gotta get a good grip of the Agrippinus. About to say, I grip my nuts has a glory hole. What the hell's going on? <laughs> what is what is happening? He needs to get his grip. Yeah. Bishop Paul II sought refuge in the first level of the building amid religious strife in the eighth century. In front of the basilica, he constructed the baptismal pool, which is still there. San Gennaro, a Christian, um, a Christian executed in Pazuho oh boy. 
Pazioli, right? Yeah. yeah. In 305 CE, for declaring his faith in Christianity, became a martyr during the Great Persecution. However, until Bishop John I relocated them to the lower-level catacombs in the early 5th century, his remains remain in Agromarciano in Pazulio. Paz, pa, <laughs> Paz, Pazioli. 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 As a result, the catacombs adopted the name Catacombs of San Gennaro and came to be associated with the well-known patron saint. Christians then intensified their visits to the site while it underwent another round of enlargement. So they just kept making this damn place bigger. To accommodate the increased number of visitors to this now extremely sensitive religious monument, an enlargement of the upper level was required when San Gennaro was moved into a lower level cub- cubicle. He's moving his body all around, huh? Just going everywhere. In addition to wanting um, to honor St. Gennaro, many Christians also want a mausoleum close to his final resting place. Due to this, work on the upper level graves and constructing a new basilica and the crypt of the bishops. That's awesome. Crypt of the bishops. <laughs> Coming to Cleveland. <laughs> crypt of the bishops. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, above San Gennaro's cubicle began. In addition to their names and magnificent mosaics, some of the early bishops of Naples were listed in the bishop's crypt. The adage, quote, a picture is worth a thousand words, surely applies to this outstanding painting depicting a woman, a female, and a man. And you've seen that one? Mm-hmm. Yeah, pretty cool. It's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of really, really, like, outstanding, um, <clears throat> like, it's weird how they do them, too, because it almost looks like they're not painting on them. They're actually, like, taking pieces of, like, different colored rock and putting it in there to make it look like a painting. But they're so small and minute that it actually looks like it's a fluid picture. It's so cool. Did you hear about the farmer that was better than everyone else? No. Oh, yeah. He was outstanding in his field. <laughs> so good anyway oh, okay <laughs> i'm sorry i don't even know why they came from <laughs> Woo! so this work is one of the most significant art pieces in the san Gennaro tomb since it's uh it lists the names of the family members and their ages at death that's pretty cool so the uh vibrant painting is placed above an affluent family's grave in the upper entryway of the catacomb According to its location, the family passed away between the 2nd or 3rd century A.D. and the 6th century A.D. Okay, what? The family passed away between the 2nd or 3rd century A.D. and the 6th century. That's kind of a a long time. Yeah, a little bit. (laughs) So, um, uh, let's see. What is this? Iloratus? Iloratus? Yeah, okay. Was the mother's name, according to the writing on this painting. She passed away at the age of 45, according to the fresco. Next, Ilaratus' daughter, Nanosa, passed away at two years on and ten months old. Finally, oh boy, Theotechnus, Theo, ah, Theotechnus? Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Nanosa's father passed away at 65. Damn, that's pretty old for back then. Yeah. Shit. Intriguingly, the fresco lists their ages, not the year of their deaths. Oh, okay. So they're, they're speculating. Speculating. Okay. speculating, yeah. It's speculatory. Postulate. They're postulating. They think. Yes, there you go. <laughs> There is evidence that the fresco has undergone at least three previous restorations. The original layer, according to researchers, solely uh, solely showed Nanosa. Then it was covered by a fresh fresco uh, depicting Nanosa and her father after her father died. The three were finally revealed in a final fresco after uh, Ilaratus. 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 Yeah. Ilaratus. Yeah. After she passed away. So, Nanosa is depicted in the fresco with both hands raised and facing outward while donning a scarlet garment. This gesture has served as a visual metaphor for praise and prayer in a religious setting since antiquity and continues to do so today. A crown floats above her, he- or above her head, although she appears to be wearing a wreath around her head. So, the crown's up here floating and yes. then the wreath. Okay. The crown stands for her condition of holiness or righteousness and the eternal life she has attained due to her moral rectitude. In other words, she devout yeah right her outfit is adorned with more jewels and she wears a pearl necklace gonna go right past that one (laughs) theotechnus is uh depicted sporting a trim beard his clothing appears to be decorated with antelopes leaping (laughs) now i just got that 12 days of christmas in my head (laughs) illyriatus and uh, theotechnus also extend one hand in a position of praise with the other facing the body illyriatus additionally dresses in gloomy colors to indicate her state of sadness in this instance, the family's attire and accessories make their riches abundantly evident. This artwork from the 4th century features a peacock as its subject, in contrast to the majority of painted uh, or uh, Arcosolia. Arcosolia. Yeah, it's like family painting. Yeah. Which show pictures of the person buried below. On the peacock's left and right sides, two birds are seated above him. Next to him, there appear to be fountains on both sides. On the right-hand fountain, another tiny bird may be seen. 
The painting's background is covered in rose petals, and the peacock is perched on a bed of flowers. These stand for joy in the hereafter. Yeah. So there you go. That I mean, now you know what that means, right? You know what I'm saying? Uh, quote, in Christian iconography, the peacock symbolizes the immor- immortality of the soul, which enjoys eternal life. In the past, it symbolized the awakening of life in the spring because it loses and renews the feathers while the wheel of his tail became picture of a starry sky. Yeah, 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 yeah. There you go. So two ladies, Cerula and Batalia, have drawn much controversy uh, on the global stage. Each woman is depicted in an open-armed prayer pose in a fresco on one of their uh, arcosolio. Gospels, probably on fire, float above and close to their heads. The long-standing debate over whether or not women held important positions in early Christianity may now be resolved, according to some experts, who believe this iconography was designated for bishops in the church. She is also seen in Cerula's 5th century fresco with the Chi Ro symbol, which stands for Christ. So, in other words, she could have been a person of importance Great in importance. the church. Yeah. You know? Which is huge for back then. Because, right. I mean, you never hear of no female popes. No. Nah. Or bishops. Mm-mm. Or cardinals. I think there is now. You really? I think I think I read something someplace that there is actually like a female cardinal now. Maybe, maybe mm-hmm. more than one. I think I could be completely mistaken. You know, I drink a lot. Anyway. Yeah. According to a report in the Telegraph, Pope Galasius expressed his displeasure with women serving at Christian altars in a letter to the bishops of South Italy in the late 5th fi- uh, century. So fuck that guy. Mm-hmm. Before a Lombard prince stole and transported his remains in uh, Benevento in 8- 831, St. Genarius stayed in his cubicle at the catacombs of St. Gennaro. They were eventually delivered back to Naples in 1497, resting in the cathedral. Robbers stole, Rob, I love that it says robbers. <laughs> yep. Robbers stole from the tombs from the 13th through the 18th century. Caretakers dug up the graves and moved most of the remains to the Fontanelle Cemetery, close to the St. Uh, San Gennaro catacombs. So, I mean, that's that, that's all pretty crazy. Crazy. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, it, it, and we could go on forever. Like I said, we could probably do five freaking episodes on Italy itself. You kind know? of want to, but then again, we didn't. We, we, yeah, too yeah. Much. yeah. It wouldn't be fair to the other countries that we've known so far. Like, Mother Russia. Yeah, that one was a good one. Yes, that's very good. Yeah. It's very nice. It's very sweet and tasty. It's very, very good. Um, so let's talk about some quick hitters here, all right? Okay. All right, we'll do some quick hitters, and then uh, we'll move on. And you know what I'm saying. You know we, how we do. So we all know about Michelangelo, right? Oh, yeah. You know, he... he Made this amazing statue and a bunch of all uh, other cool shit. Uh, yeah, he do you remember has what the, a fascination with naked dudes. And and do you know what that statue's name is? Uh, the Thinker. David. That's what I said yes. <laughs> did he? He didn't do the Thinker, did he? I don't. Think I don't he remember. Did. Actually, don't I don't remember. think he did. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give that to myself. Whatever. Yeah. So when we were over there, we actually got to see. In Florence, we got to see where Michelangelo is buried. Oh. He's also buried in the same tomb, and it's huge. When I say tomb, this is like a huge construct. I bet. Uh, alongside, like, uh, I want to say, uh, was it uh, Machiavelli? I think so. Oh. Yeah. So, so even though Michelangelo was Florentine, you know, from Florence, and loved his town, he spent the last three decades of his life in Rome. This self-imposed exile started when Alessandro de' Medici, and we are going to do... A Medici episode. Oh, oh. Yes. I was going to add it to it, but it needs its own. It needs its own. And it might just be a bonus episode. Yeah. So, Patreon, get over there, sign up, subscribe, become a Patreon member. It's five bucks. Get it. Go. Okay. Anyway, so, um, uh, Alessandro di Medici was made the first Duke of Florence. All right. Mm -hmm. Michelangelo considered him a tyrant. So, from the 1530s, um, even after Alessandro's death, he preferred living under the rule of the popes in Rome. Okay. Now, when Michelangelo died in February 18th of 1564, he was initially laid to rest in the SS Apostoli Church in Rome. Oh, okay. However, when Duke Cosimo, uh, Cosimo, oh boy, Cosimo I di Medici heard about this development, he declared that since he was not able to employ Michelangelo and honor him in Florence during his life, he would honor him in death with a state funeral and a proper tomb in Florence. Oh, okay. Leonardo uh, Buon, uh, Buon, uh, Buon, uh, Branarotti, okay, Michelangelo's uh, Michelangelo's nephew and heir, was assigned the task of stealing his corpse. <laughs> <laughs> yep, he had it sent secretly in a bale of hay, disguising it as a piece of merchandise. This way, no one in Rome, including the Pope, would be able to prevent the movement of Michelangelo's body back to Florence. Hey, what you got in that cut over there? Oh, it's just it's a rug. <laughs> 
<laughs> so truthfully, like Michelangelo was like, fuck the Medici's. Yeah. You know, he loved Florence, but he's like, I'm staying in Rome. And when he died there, <laughs> they went and stole his fucking body. Hey, how crazy is that? I never, I never heard that story. That's pretty epic. Yeah, I learned about that when we were over there. I was like, get the fuck out of here. All right, so let's talk about some of the, the most popular haunted places in Italy, okay? All right, you down? Yeah, you down? All let's right. go. So there's the Haunted Chapel of the Dead, Ooh. or the Capella Mortiti in Otranto. You said Mortiti. Mortiti. <laughs> Capella Mortiti. I need Mortiti. Hey, I am hungry. I would like a Capella Mortiti. <laughs> Shake and not stirred. <laughs> every yeah, every name awesome. over there just sounds like a really good food. Oh, it's awesome. So uh, Chiesa di Morti, or the Church of the Dead, is a small church in the medieval town of Urbania in central Italy. Built by the Normans in the 11th century in Otranto, a town in the province of Apulia, the church gained its notoriety from the stacked bones and skulls of 830 Otranto martyrs who were tragically beheaded during the Turkish massacre, massacre of 1480. Oof. Furthermore, the stone on which these massacres were performed is exhibited in glass cases behind the altar. On top of that, there's also a dungeon-like crypt that brave visitors can actually enter. Mm. A macabre display of mummies behind the altar has been going on since 1833. They are held in individual glass cases, 18 mummies total. The bodies have been mummified via a special mold that dries all the moisture out of the bodies. Yeah. Sounds pretty cool, right? Oh. Yeah, I like that one. That's cool. Then there's the haunted Cadario in Venice. Built in the 15th century, the Cadario building is known as one of the most haunted buildings in Venice. It was originally owned by Giovanni Dario, who lost his son to murder and a daughter to suicide while they lived in the house. Yikes. There were two more murders and suicides in Cadario, and the 13 successive owners have all died mysteriously. Ooh. Yeah. Ooh. Don't want to live there. Mm -mm. Architecturally beautiful, Cadario is a home on the edge of the uh, Canal Grande, uh, locals refer to it as the house of no return because of the eerie and mysterious deaths that have occurred to anyone who has owned the building. Pretty neat. Hmm. Then there's the haunted capuchin catacombs in Palermo. More catacombs. Are there a bunch of mon monkeys there? I, I Well, I mean, but, but I, but let's find out. <laughs> it's not enough that the capuchin catacombs is a burial crypt, but it's, uh, it's known for its scary and haunted atmosphere because of the 8,000 mummies that line its walls in varying uh, with some of the uh, them morbidly set up in different poses. Oh. 8,000 mummies. Morbidly posed. Morbidly posed, yes. The crypt is located off the uh, mainland in Palermo, Sicily, and was originally meant for the monks of the Capuchin Monastery. Not the monkeys. Ah. But eventually, other people of status were allowed to be buried there. Where did it get its sinister reputation? Hmm? It's because many tourists reported hearing whistling and whispering and even returned to a room to find that the skeletons have moved into different fucking positions. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> ruh, ruh, raggy. <laughs> nope. <laughs> Not doing that one. Like Zoing. <laughs> right. We got to get out of here, Scoob. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. <laughs> then there's the mummies of Ferentillo in Umbria. Okay. The uh, mummies are usually embalmed on purpose due to the request of the deceased family. But what about the dead bodies that were transformed into mummery, uh, mummies on their own? Many of the bodies buried at the Church of San Stefano in the town of Ferentillo in southern Umbria uh, were preserved by a rare microfungus. Oh. The phenomenon is so bizarre that some of the bodies are on display at the Museum of Mummies in, at, at, of Ferentillo at the bottom of the church. The bodies are so well preserved that some of the corpses still have hair, beards, and teeth, and a few are wearing clothes. Among the corpses on display is that of a mother with her baby, and even more sinister are the bodies of a lawyer who was murdered and his murderer. Oh. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Pretty pretty badass. Uh, there's the Haunted Museum of Purgatory in Rome. That sounds absolutely disastrous right there. Sounds kind of like you're stuck in a single place. Yeah. It's located in the uh, small church of Sacra Qua. Oh, boy. Sacra Core Sofragio near Castle Sant'Angelo in the center of Rome. It alleges to have recorded various instances of souls trapped between heaven and hell, trying to draw the attention of the living to ask them for their prayers and help them pass into heaven. You can see, quote unquote, evidence of purgatory and the paranormal, such as photos of imprints on sleeves and handprints burned into the pages of prayer books. Hmm. <laughs> this one I thought was pretty cool. The Haunted Witches Village of Triora in Liguria. The Haunted Witches Village. 
Village. Village. Many legends and stories spur from natural tragedies such as famines, like the two-year famine that occurred in 1587 in the village of Trioria in the region of Liguria. Like many things at the time, the famine was blamed on witchcraft, and a group of women were blamed for it. Of course. During the witch trials, 300 women were accused, and 50 of them were tortured, and some died during their interrogations. Jeez. The Triora Museum is dedicated to the women who were tortured and killed, and records of their confessions are on exhibit. And, uh, yeah, it's pretty pretty creepy. That's ridiculous. Yeah. Then there's the Medieval Criminal and Torture Museum in Tuscany. I heard about this. It's supposed to be amazing. Really? Yeah. So they, and I didn't know about this uh, because I would have gone if I could have because Tuscany is right. The Florence is right there. You know what I mean? So you're saying it's not torture to go to this museum? Oh, boy. <laughs> there are many types of museums around the world, some dedicated to the history and others to art. But, uh, you know, the, the, this is the first time that we've, uh, the, you know, that you can actually say that the, uh, there's a torture museum. Okay. Located in San, uh, oh boy, I'm going to mess this one up. Gimagnano, Gimagnano in Tuscany. This torture museum showcases disturbing equipment used to torture victims during the Roman Inquisition. Ah, so not that kind of torture. Damn. Yeah. Including Iron Maidens, guillotines, and torture chains used on those considered heretics. Mm. Yeah. So, of course, everyone says it is absolutely haunted. Uh, Then there's Palazzo Dario in uh, Venice. Okay. One of the most well-known um, haunted houses in the world, the Dario Palace, has been called the house that kills. And for good reason, as almost everyone who has owned, lived, or been associated with the house has died tragically. Another one. Oh. Be it through murders, suicides, accidents, or bankruptcy. Died from bankruptcy. Yep. Would the fucking bank come over and just kill him? Ah. Uh, <laughs> man, I'm not going to put anything past anybody anymore. <laughs> yeah, nah. Really? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the daughter of Giovanni Dario, the local official who built the palace on the Grand Canal in the 15th century, committed suicide. And since then, there have been around 10 deaths that also occurred in the palace. The most recent of which happened in 2002. Rumors claim that you can sometimes hear the echo of the cries of various Venetian residents who have died there. Oh, boy. So I'm going to stay away from that part of Venice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Then there's the Cadel Anime, the haunted house of souls in Voltri. Well, most of these castles and houses have a history of hauntings. The house, This house has a history of mystery, of mysterious disappearances. It used to be an inn for travelers who frequented the road between Lombardy and Piedmont. Allegedly, the innkeeper would greet the, uh, the travelers and lead them to a quiet and secluded room to rest and sleep after sharing drinks. Once the travelers fell asleep, the ceiling would cave in and crush them. What? Yep. Afterwards, the innkeeper would dispose of the remains and gather their valuable belongings. It's a death house. But the, the ceiling would cave in? I, Multiple times. <laughs> what? Recently, a bag was uncovered near the house containing bones dating back to the 19th century. The inn remained empty until World War II when a family took refuge there. They reported strange occurrences like objects moving on their own and even screams coming from the room where all of the murders had happened. And the ceiling's falling, apparently. <laughs> it all came to a head when one night a girl knocked on the door asking about her missing fiancé. The girl clearly came from another era and spoke of people dead for at least 200 years. Ooh. Despite its mysterious and spooky history, the house is still inhabited today but those who live there claim to have experienced paranormal activity as they glimpsed apparitions on more than one occasion. Yeah. I kind of want to know if they uh, fix the ceiling issue that they have there. <laughs> <laughs> we don't go in that room. We just, we just don't go there. Yeah. It's, just, we, it's, yeah. it's closed. Yeah, we don't do that. Then there's the Castello Aragon, uh, uh, Aragonis in Pizzo Calabro. Okay. Yeah. Castello, Castello Aragonis is where King... Oh, uh, Giochino, uh, okay, King Giochino Murat was shot to death after Napoleon was defeated in 1815. That is more than enough to make people suspect the occurrence of supernatural activity. Visitors claim to have experienced strange occurrences that indicate that the ghost of Murat still roams the palace, perhaps looking for vengeance. Oh, yeah. Uh, let's see, we'll do a couple more here. There's, uh, let's see, the ghost of Donna Olympia in Rome. Oh. Ghosts in Italy are not all, only confined to buildings. They seem to be able to roam the streets as well. Ha! Fucking hell. No. Making the country one of the most haunted in the world. One of the famous ghosts in the country is that of Donna Olympia. 
a social climber who fled Rome with two cases of gold coins when her brother-in-law, Pope Innocent X, died. But a successor, Pope Alexander VI, exiled her and she reportedly died of the plague shortly afterwards. It is said that her ghost appears in a carriage drawn by black horses riding at full speed around the Ponte Sisto and in Piazza Navona, where she used to live. Yeah, it's crazy. See, that's the issue with, like, old-ass places, because we don't know what the hell they did back in the day. Yeah. You know, like, you hear, like, ghost stories and shit in the U.S., but we're not, we, we ain't that old. Yeah. But, like, there, I don't know. Man. Yeah, uh, I mean. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, you got millions of people that were killed, probably, in ways that they didn't want to be. So, yeah. It's a lot of uh, negative energy. I would say so. Yeah. I would say so, yes. Yeah. yeah. It's still beautiful, and I'd live there. I don't care. Oh, 100%. I'll fuck with some ghosts. I don't care. Fuck it. Hey, want me to drink? Yeah, it's fine. We're in the back of your carriage. Fine. (laughs) Exactly. Right, please. (laughs) Are you my Uber? (laughs) Are you you my Uber? I love your horses. What are the names? The horses are pretty. Can I pet one of them? No? Okay. I'll just get in the back. (laughs) Now there's the the, 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 the devil... Devil Monk's Monastery. Oh. As the story goes, one day a uh, scared traveler stopped by a monastery to ask for help, and he was fed and given shelter. He felt so indebted to them for their warm welcome that he received that he decided to work in the monastery to pay them back for their kindness. As the years went by, he decided to become a monk, but after he took his religious vows, he fell in love with a woman. Mm. Things did not go smoothly afterwards as he started having doubts that she was a witch, and he began torturing her to extract a confession. What the fuck? The woman died as a result of her torture, and he eventually lost his mind, changed his appearance, and started to scare everyone around him. His actions became so erratic that all the monks and most of the villagers abandoned the village because the, they suspected him of committing murders. One day, a lost homeless couple asked uh, for help, and the monk welcomed them um, in with open arms. However, the next day, the man that was welcomed by the monk walked into the village with his skull broken, and the woman was nowhere to be found. Oh. The king ordered the monk to be hanged. But it is said that his ghost is still wandering the monastery, scaring all of those who come near. Nope. It's pretty awesome. <clears throat> yeah. I'm sorry. I think that was badass. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's something. All right. Then there's Castello di, uh, di, Bard, or di Bardi in Parma. Oh, nice. And not Ohio. Parma, Italy. <laughs> <laughs> in the 14th century, Moriallo, a young officer, um, a young officer called what? A young officer fell in love, okay, it's written, whatever, fell in love with a beautiful young woman called Celeste, who was from a noble family. But of course, he couldn't ask them for her hand in marriage because of his lack of fortune, so they kept their love hidden, and she continued to wait for him as he went off to battle. A few weeks later, Celeste spotted a group of soldiers approaching the castle, carrying the enemy's flag as a sign of victory. She mistakenly believed that Moriello was killed, so in her grief, she threw herself off the high castle wall and died. Moriello was shocked to find out what happened, because he wasn't dead, to his love, so in his grief, he decided to jump off one of the castle's towers. According to legends, his ghost still wanders the castle grounds in search of Celeste. However, some Italian ghostbusters okay, actually reported that the man- they managed to take photos of a monk's ghost and not of the young lover. So, there's that. Man, what is with all the uh, Romeo and Juliet stuff going on in Italy? Because it's all about love, my friend. It's all about the love. And now, boys and girls, it's your favorite part of the show, the movie review. Which top ten movies will make the cut today? Uh, today. Today. Hey, what, 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 what movies are we going to be talking about today? Eh? Today we're talking about the best Italian horror movies. Oh. Yeah, the best Italian horror Horror movies. So it's, they say bippity bop a lot in those movies, I'm assuming. <laughs> I don't think we've seen any of these, to be honest with you. Well, for, for Frizzle? Yeah, these are like actual, like, oh, actually, well, I lied. I lied. There's there's a couple of them on here. That, that you've seen? Yes. Okay. Oh, no, you've not seen any of these, for sure. Oh, okay. Uh, number 10 on the list, this comes from Imdaba. Okay, number 10 is Beyond the Darkness from 1979. Oh, great movie. Yeah, sure enough. <laughs> Directed by Joe DeMato, 6.2 stars, a disturbed young taxidermist, always good, exhumes his recently deceased girlfriend, oh boy, brings her body to his family villa and proceeds to embalm her corpse with help from a strange housekeeper. But his bouts of insanity are just the beginning. So that's that one. And it's unrated too. Ooh. So that sounds pretty pretty awesome. 70s movie that's unrated. Yeah. Wow. Number nine, The House with Laughing Windows. Oh, that sounds cool. Number seven, or number seven, seven stars on this. Uh, Stefano 
a young restorer is commissioned to save a controversial mural located in the church of a small, isolated village. And it says, uh, Poopy Avati, that's the director. P- poopy? Poopy. P U P I. It's Poopy. That's not an A. It's Poopy. Poopy. <laughs> Puppy. Hey, hey Poppy. <laughs> <laughs> His most memorable excursion into horror is undoubtedly an, uh, an acquired taste as its pacing is slow and its plot not too forthcoming. But what can't be denied is the film's ability to suck you into its strange otherworldliness. Not a strange forward, wait, not a straightforward uh, giallo, uh, I guess, as at times the atmosphere strains of the supernatural, but the overall effect is queasy and very satisfy and very satisfying. Damn it. Um, yeah, it's, it's got a shocking ending, apparently. Ooh. Yeah, never heard of that one, so... Uh, number eight, this is from 1981, Burial Ground, The Nights of Terror, hmm. or La Notte de Terrore. Oh, I like that. Yeah. 5.6 stars, an archaeology professor discovers an ancient crypt which contains living dead corpses. The zombies go on a rampage and attack a group of people with the which the professor had invited to celebrate his discovery. Andrea Bicha, Bia, Bia, Bianchi. Yes, that's that's this one. Hmm. And it says, okay, so this doesn't win any points for cinematic brilliance or anything technically superior, but this incredibly frantic and silly zombie movie has everything that's good about Italian gore movies of the 70s and early 80s. Fair enough. Yeah, it could be cool. Uh, Number seven is Deep Red from 1975. Hmm. 7.5 stars. Directed by Dario Argento. He's an amazing, amazing actor. Or not uh, actor, but director. A jazz pianist and wisecracking journalist are pulled into a complex web of mystery after the former, uh, the former witnesses the brutal murder of a psychic. Oh, yeah, this is uh, Argento's breakthrough movie. Yeah, really? Oh no, 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 no. Um, uh, uh, Giallo is his breakthrough movie. Sorry, it says that this one's just it's it's up there with it. Ah, number six, 1966, Kill Baby Kill, six point nine stars. A Carpathian village is haunted by the ghost of a murderous little girl, prompting a coroner and a medical student to uncover her secrets while a witch attempts to protect the villagers. Hmm. Maria Bava oh. is the director on that one. Number five, Let Sleeping Corpses Lie. I've heard of this one. Have you? Mm-hmm. Have you really? I haven't seen it, but I've heard of it. Okay. Uh, 6.8 stars, a cop chases two hippies suspected of a series of Manson family-like murders. Unbeknownst to him, the real culprits are the living dead, brought to life with a hunger for human flesh by ultrasonic radiation being used for pest control. <laughs> Oh uh, yeah, that's a unique spin. That is interesting. Um, speaking of the Manson family kind of murder shit, uh, um, just watched um, oh, what is it called? Oh, one, what is it? One night in um in Hollywood or something like that? With, Bangkok? No, it's a recent movie with Leonardo DiCaprio and Brad Pitt. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's something like, it's like that. One night in Hollywood. Yeah, I think something like that. About, yeah. I forget what the hell it's called, dude. It's amazing. Really? I didn't know that it was a um. Um, 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 why can't I think of his name right now? The, the director that did Pulp Fiction. Oh, Quentin Tarantino. Yes, it was a Tarantino movie, and I didn't know that. And at the end, I'm like, man, this seems like a Tarantino movie. And sure enough, it was. That's actually pretty funny. It was awesome. Really? I thought it was great. I he was done with movies. Uh, no, I guess not. It <laughs> well, just came out like, what, last year, the year before? No kidding. I think it's like one night in Hollywood or whatever. And one you guys don't have to message or text us or, or not text, but tweet or whatever. And we'll figure it out before you guys even get a chance to do that. So, ha. <laughs> Number four on the list, aha, Cannibal Holocaust. And I have seen this one. Oh. Yes, and we've talked about this one before. 5.8 stars. During a rescue mission to the Amazon rainforest, a professor stumbles across lost films shot by a missing documentary crew. This is directed by Riguero Diodato. This is the one where they actually were brought up on charges because they thought it was real. Oh, that's right. Yeah. 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 It's unrated. Mm -hmm. It's good. And it's definitely 70s. Number three, 1979's Zombie. It's just zombie. Zombie. So the cranberries are part of it? Yeah, no. Oh. 6.8 stars. Strangers searching for a young woman's missing father arrive at a tropical island where a doctor desperately seeks the cause and cure of a recent epidemic of the undead. Directed by Lucio Fuici. Fuici. Or Fuici. Maybe Fuici because it's only one. I don't know. Number two. Suspiria. Okay. Uh, From 1977. 7.3 stars. An American newcomer to a prestigious German ballet academy comes to realize that the school is a front for something sinister amid a series of grisly murders. Dario Argento. That's him again. Oh. I'm telling you, he was like the guy back in the day. Wow. Yeah. And then number one on the list, this is 1981's The Beyond. Oh. 6.6 stars. A young woman inherits an old hotel in Louisiana 
where following a series of supernatural accidents, she learns that the building was built over one of the entrances to hell. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> so yeah, uh, I haven't seen I, any of those except for the uh, the Cannibal Holocaust, and I've only seen like bits and pieces of that one. Really? Yeah, I mean it's gory. Really? It's like gory, gory, gory. Like seriously, they were brought up on charges because they thought it was real, like terrifier, uh, gory. But it's but it's uh, it's supposed to be found footage. Ah. So there's like, yeah, so there's like, you know, animals being mutilated and shit like that. Mm. And they thought it was actually happening. Damn. You know, like someone actually did this. So they were actually brought up on charges for it. Actually, I said actually like 15 times. Actually. Actually. Huh. Actually. Are we doing another interview for uh, the History Channel? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, no, (laughs) not not doing that. So that's my friends, dear passengers, dear listeners, was Italy. I hope you enjoyed that ride with us. I did. I, I absolutely love doing uh, or going through the research and whatnot yeah. and learning a lot of stuff that I didn't really know about and stuff that I did know about and diving further into that. You know what I mean? There's a lot. Listen, when you go over to Europe or Asia or pretty much any place outside of the United States, mm-hmm. the history is just insane. The history is rich. You know what I mean? Like culturally and, and like especially when it comes to like creepy stuff and oh, ghosts yeah. and you know all this bad shit that took place way back in the day because you know witch witch she's a witch and all that bullshit yeah. you know and then all the plagues and just I mean it was, it's just nuts it's crazy so it's cool to dive into that and we would like to know what you guys think of our little trip over there over to Italy I would not mind going back no I would definitely go back for sure love it like literally <laughs> I would love to go back. So make sure to stop over to our official website, the Midnight Train Podcast dot com. At our website, you can buy yourself some super sweet, I said super sweet merchandise. All right, you can get all kinds of stuff. We got shirts, we got hats, we got jackets, we've got leggings, we've got phone cases. We we got it all. Get over there, get yourself some stuff. We got some stuff, and it's pretty. It's priced pretty well. I don't think it's crazy priced. You know what I mean? We're not making and like a ton of money off of it. You know what I mean? It, it's it's pretty. Yeah, it is. Mm-hmm. And, of course, you know, we actually donate a percentage of that. We do. So we'll talk about that. And if you like what you've heard from us, and damn it, I hope you have, consider being a show producer, all right? Be one of the first class passengers by heading on over to the Midnight Train com and clicking on the Patreon button or just go to patreon.com forward slash the Midnight Train Podcast for only $5 a month. I mean, it's like it's a coffee. Yeah. It's, it's barely a gallon of gas. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, it's five bucks. Yeah, man. And it goes a long way for us to do what we need to do. Correct. For the show. Exactly. You know what I mean? If you guys are like, what are they doing? Well, guess what we're not doing? We still have jobs. Well, yeah. we, we're supposed to. Ouch. <laughs> Sorry. Ouch. Ouch. <laughs> Unfortunately, Logan. Um, yeah, I got laid off. He got laid off yeah, from, his, from his job. Yeah. So any of your patronage would be very much appreciated. Hey, man, I have more time to do research. Yeah, now. absolutely. <laughs> It's going to get better and better. Oh, yeah. So so help us out. Get all the bonuses. And, uh, you know, you can get over there and there's other tiers and stuff where you can get custom uh, stickers, posters. All I mean, the bonuses are where it's at, though. Heck like yeah, the, the, the Fuck That Guy series and so much else. So get on over there. Support the show. Support Logan. <laughs> and and help, help us out. And, and get the bonuses. That's, <laughs> that's the big out. thing. It's not like, you know, you're not getting, you're not, you're, you're getting something cool. Right. You know what I mean? Additional con- uh, content. There it is. It's a DLC, I think is what they call that in the video game world. Download content? Yeah. But, well, I guess technically, yeah. Yeah, yeah I guess. If you want yeah. to explore more, download the content. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. And, of course, we love music. If you didn't know that, guess what we do? And we want future generations of musicians to have accessibility and music education. So we have decided to give to a great cause, the Save the Music Foundation. Their mission is to help students, schools, and communities reach their full potential through the power of making music. As one of the leading music foundations in the United States, they support their... Excuse me, did you hear that? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, man. My stomach was like, shut up already. <laughs> they support their partner communities in three ways, by donating musical instruments and musical technology, providing support services for teachers, and advocating for music education. Hot damn. Hot and dignity. we donate 20% of our merchandise and patri- or sales and Patreon donations um, from this show, as well as Icons and Outlaws, yes. which I know I keep saying it's coming. It's coming. I'm sorry. It's just... We're getting we're getting back to it. Everything's happening. So we continue. Right. So we and we give twenty percent from everything. Um so support the show, get a ton of bonuses, and help a great cause. And for more information or to donate personally, go to savethemusic.org. 
Don't forget to follow us on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube. Rate us wherever you can rate us, like Spotify, Apple Music, or Google, or yeah. I don't even know, where, wherever you could rate us at. Podbean. Bring us your ratings personally. Yes. Yeah, what? What? Personally. Yeah, just hand us the five-star review. Just, just going to we'll post it on our doors. Like when you're a little kid, you get an actual five yeah. star. I'm, yeah. I would love that. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, do that for us because it really does help get us up the charts and whatnot. Um, I know we're doing uh, significantly well on the, the history charts. Oh, yeah. yeah. Which is pretty cool. Yeah. It's actually doing pretty well. So uh, we appreciate you guys for listening and for getting us up there. Spread the word. That is the biggest, biggest, biggest way to do it. Yes. You know what I mean? Do it. And uh, listen, can't thank you all enough for the love and support we've received. Honestly, our socials have been blowing up lately, and I love it. New people just posting up going, where the hell did you guys come from? Oh, yeah. It's pretty cool. You've been here for a while, man. Yep. You guys keep this train moving. So thank you so much for listening. A very special thank you to our fearless executive producer, Patreon poopers. That's right. I said it. I don't care. Ooh. First class passengers. <laughs> To Mindy F., George DeJesus, Megan McTerry, Tomislav Sabota, Amanda Denz, Chris Lucas, Zachary Danielson, Joseph Aramo, Kelly Ryan, Nathan Diekman, Nicholas Cooper, Caitlin McKinney, Trent Scott, Spencer Dunlap, Jacob Cook, Maggie Brothers, Miles Campbell, Brian Gunselman, Pumpkin Escobar, Mac Doherty, Turner Cox, Sydney Sayer, Jenna Sherrill, Chad Flint, Chris McLeod, Justin Kowalczyk, Rob Webb from the Fun Box Podcast. Make sure you check them out. Christina Skelton and Jessica Bartolome from the Sisters Skelton Podcast. Make sure you check our sisters from another mister out, right? <laughs> uh, Maria Gibbs, Chainsaw. Um, what the fuck? There you go. I actually got to see him the other day. He stopped in. Yeah. So it was good to see you, buddy. Absolutely. Uh, to Jigsaw, Rick Resler, Courtney Bachelor, Katie Brabinick, and of course, <coughs> are you ready? I know you got a little bit of a cold. This <coughs> yeah. actually should sound really good. It's going to sound awesome. Now you've got this cold. Yes. To our boy, Bill Birch. Oh, good for you. <laughs> that was a guy that was really deep. Did you hear that? <laughs> <laughs> oh fucking hell <laughs> it was like so raspy oh my god my that was voice is a little yeah rough. that's probably one of the best ones yet <laughs> so listen thank you so much for listening to, to us as we get into your ear holes and we talk uh, about uh, you know some of the cool stuff that we like out there unsolved stuff creepy stuff uh, history especially like we just love it so much and uh, yeah thanks for being here and uh as always, stay safe out there, and uh, of course, shoot you, motherfucker. Now go home and get your fucking shine box. Hey, Baba the Boopy. <laughs>